Hello, welcome to my session, Culturally Responsive Counseling, and I'm Kimberly Johnson. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. This is the time for us to learn why it is important and necessary to be culturally competent, to understand how to evaluate yourself, your school, and your comprehensive counseling program, and to learn how to improve cultural competency by acting as a systemic change agent. Neutral. Well, as you could tell from these quotes, there's no such thing as neutral. And I like the, the quote in the bottom uh, left corner that says the educator has the duty of not being neutral. So we cannot stand neutral in times like these. If you're the patient on the operating table, you don't want the doctors or nurses to be neutral. You want them to hold each other accountable for their actions. Uh, if somebody was to leave a sponge in you accidentally or to do something wrong, you want somebody to speak up. The Maasai tribe in Kenya, Africa, they greet each other by asking how are the children because they have determined that if the children are healthy, then the whole society is healthy. So I'm wondering today with these pictures from Louisville, Kentucky, how are the children? Culture. Culture is the totality of everything about you. Uh, is there shallow culture, there's culture that you can see, and then there's deep culture. So I just wanted to put that definition out there. Culture is very, very important. It's the totality of your being. I remember feeling so special seeing my name printed at the front of the envelope. For the first time in my memory, I felt a part of my school and community. You see, I grew up in Maine, a predominantly white state, in a kindergarten classroom with predominantly white students and me. Oftentimes I felt othered in the classroom from coloring activities consisting of drawing your families and being confused. Do I pick up the peach crayon like everyone else in my classroom or the brown one? commonly used to color in tree trunks or being the only one with kinky curly hair protected under braids each week as classmates were discussing having to brush their stray hair every morning or maybe i really felt different during class discussions, talking about our favorite food. And classmates went around saying pizza, macaroni and cheese. And being self-conscious to sputter out my mother's traditional food of rice and pondu. Recognizing at so young that no one had said anything similar to it that when it was my turn, pizza was the only thing that could come out of my mouth. This situation in kindergarten was the first time I realized I'm split between my Congolese and Rwandan culture and my way of life at school. But you see, this invitation, this golden ticket was what made me feel special. All right. Why should we, why should we be concerned about the history of counseling, school counseling? 
Well, we should be concerned because as I've highlighted here, modern school counseling grew from discoveries, inventions, and mistakes of yesterday. Uh, we need to particularly look at mistakes because there were many. And so that's where we've come from. And in order to know where we're going, we need to pay attention to that. So the history of counseling is laden with many, many people. And as you can see, most of them are white males. So when we do a check of privilege and check of mar marginalization, because when you have privilege, then um, you're bound to marginalize those that are not privileged in whatever area that is. And so you marginalize them. So as you can see, most of the founding fathers of counseling were white males. They probably were Christians. Um, I'm sure they were educated. Uh, and I'm sure they were middle class or higher. And so they created counseling under that framework. Based on history, education, including counseling changes. We know that when there's economic problems, counseling changes. We know that when there's educational concerns, counseling changes. And we know when there's social concerns, counseling changes. And so all of those things make counseling do, have to do something different because the people who we're providing counseling for, the students that we're providing counseling for, they need something different. They need something different. We have all of these things going on and they're gonna need something different uh, when they come for school counseling. And that difference is multicultural counseling. I am always with people who are different, right? Um, I was as a white that. person, you probably have very few times in which you're in an all black group, an all Asian group, or all Latino or Native uh, American group. But as a person of color, I have no choice in that. Yeah. If I want to make it in this world, I have to interact with people who differ from me. And that's part of white privilege. Um, the white privilege is your ability to decide whether you want or don't want to have interactions with, with certain groups. Right. Um, and that is what prevents us from really developing cultural competence that has meaning on an emotive and behavioral level. Uh, having it just on the cognitive level will not make you an effective uh, multicultural therapist. Multicultural. So the American School Council Association provides this statement regarding cultural competency or cultural responsiveness. And as you can see, some of the words that are highlighted to embrace cultural diversity and success for all students. All means all. Again, this is their rationale concerning culturally competence or culturally responsiveness. And um, you see some words that are big in here to stand out. Um, culturally competent in the current educational and social environment, um, knowledge and awareness and skills of how prejudice, power, and various forms of oppression affect self students and all stakeholders. All of this is vitally important to the school counseling program. Daher and Stone in 2012 provided nine different ways that school counselors can provide culturally responsive school counseling program. And these are the highlighted words that stood out from what they stated in their, their nine areas. And we're gonna talk about each area separately. So the first area was exploring their personal beliefs, attitudes. So basically it's the self work. You got to work on yourself. Uh, as you can see, behavior and capacities, they're above water. They're what everybody sees. But people don't see your convictions, your beliefs, your values, and your identities. We have so much going on. Within second, one second, 
we can encounter at least 20 million pieces of data. And experts are not even sure that we're just encountering that much data. We could be encountering so much more, but we cannot process that, so we have to take shortcuts. Also, we have two thinking systems. We have a slow thinking brain and a fast part of our brain. And so we need both of those because we don't need to be thinking about how to do those automatic things like walk, like sort of a car, like drive those things we do on a regular basis. But we do need the slow thinking also for when there's a traffic jam and you're ready to get into an accident. You have to slow down your thinking in order to think about what to rationally do. So we need both of those. We're most of the time ruled by assumptions, biases, and other automatic thoughts, which can be good or it can be terrible. And most of the times, it, most of the time it is terrible. There are over 150 biases, so we all have some. All right, so bias as regard to racial bias, uh, when you engage in stereotyping, that's cognitive, that's thinking. When you engage in prejudice, that's feelings, as affective. And then when you actually engage in discrimination, that's usually action, that's some kind of behavior that's actually above the iceberg, what people can actually see. Values. We need to do our personal value work. And I've done this with kindergartners on up. So any age can work on their values. You need to find out what are your core values. This is a list of over 220 values. So there's a website at the bottom in the bottom right corner that you can go to to find out more about how to figure out what are your core values. What is guiding you, guiding your decision making? Please read this quote as I read it. Your personal core values define who you are and the school's core values ultimately defines the school's culture. For individuals, character is destiny. For schools, culture is destiny. So this is racial identity development. And it's so important for a school counselor to know this because we don't all develop our racial identity the same. And so you can kind of let a person look at this and figure out where they are right now and what they need to do to reach the bottom, which is like the self-actualization of racial identity. Um, I'm sure there's other ways to figure out like sexual identities and other things like that, just so that the person can assess and be aware of who they are and why they're doing the things that they're doing. So know thyself. <laughs> You have to know yourself. And there's all kinds of quotes here that I'm not going to read, but I just want to point out, you got to know yourself. Uh, you got to know your inner, internal states. You got to see how your emotions affect and influence your thinking and your behavior. It's so important. It's also knowing yourself and self-awareness is some, sometimes called mind sight. And so you got to do that mind sight work. Um, I like the second bullet. We can't even trust our own minds because the human mind is incapable of seeing things in a completely honest, straightforward manner. We hide things from ourselves because we don't want to know or think that we're being mean to somebody. And so we hide that from ourselves and we are in a state of denial when we do it. Humility. Humility is accepting the reality. And it's so hard to do, but it's so important to do that, to come from a place of humility and just accept that, yeah, I made a mistake. Yeah, I have this bias and I acted upon that. Or I have this assumption and I acted upon that and it wasn't good. And so just having that willingness to learn to make change possible, that humble frame of mind. Uh, in your comprehensive school uh, school counseling program, we need the table, at the table, we need diversity and we need it set for diversity. As you can see, this table has different types of coffee, some with cream, some without cream, some with just a little bit of cream, but it's set for the diverse perspectives of who's coming to the table. And we need everybody at the table um, I've actually taken each one of these, like 
This is the second bullet point from Die Hair and Stone. And uh, I've broken down the definitions of each of the words or the major words in that statement so that we can kind of get a feel and understand what, what it means. So advocate means to plead in favor of, to aid. It means to invite. It means to intercede for someone, to protect, to champion. Every child needs a champion. Um, we need to address the impact that poverty and social class has on students. Um, I've done this lesson with students before. It's a whole lesson about the isms. And it was so enlightening. And the kids just, they took it in and they understood that who you are, you're judged by who you are. And if you're not in that dominant culture, then people let you know that. Uh, whether they do it intentionally or not, they let you know. The psychology of hate. Stereotypes, just kind of painting everyone with the same brush. Um, and stereotypes can be positive. They're still dangerous because they take away the person's individuality. So something like all, all librarians or introverts, it's not a good thing because now you've taken the individual out. Then you can follow that with scapegoating, blaming that group for certain things, for the loss of jobs or house prizes or whatever it might be. Um, and then you see the dehumanizing, um, that really uh, intense, uh, uh, cruelty, uh, really looking at that group as being subhuman. We've seen that in history, whether it was the World War or Rwanda, um, and that those are kind of the steps. And like you said, they're really all grounded in fear uh, and insecurity. Can we talk about any specific triggers that we might be able to watch for, in, you know, vulnerable people in our life that we think might be susceptible to hate? Yeah, so people in general who are disconnected, I think, are really high risk. Um, and individuals who are surrounded by that certain rhetoric or influence. I always, when I give talks um, to workplaces or parenting groups, I always say, watch your social diet. Uh, just like our physical diet, what we eat affects our body and the health of our body, our social diet, the ideas and conversations and things we consume affect our mind. So you really want to stay away from hate if you don't want to be a hateful person. Um, you want to really pay it. So the hate pyramid. I've also taught this pyramid to students. It starts off with your bias, simple things like, which is really not simple, it's a bad word, but things that you might think is small, like an insensitive remark, and then it could build up to bullying, and then discrimination, and then bias motivated violence, and end up being genocide. So the pyramid of hate, and I've told uh, kids that the way to change this pyramid of hate or the way to create a pyramid of love is to create a pyramid with the synonyms of these words. Uh, we have cultures, we need to understand how the impact of family culture, uh, what it does to student performance. So because you have a student in your class that does not uh, give you direct eye contact and they could have been taught not to or that could be a part of their culture for them not to look at someone in their eyes so you have low context cultures and high context cultures and those cultures operate very very differently so it's important to know and understand culture because what could be uh, perceived as lying because somebody's not looking at you in your eye or it could be perceived as you're talking loud, you're loud talking somebody or that you're mad, could just be that culture, that person's culture. And they could not be mad at all or be telling the truth, but you wouldn't know that because you're operating on your stereotypical biases. Evidence, using data to close the gap among diverse students. The point here that I wanted to make, and I'm not going to read this definition of evidence to you, but the point here that I wanted to make is that evidence is objective. So evidence is something that is observable, measurable, or that you've done an experiment and you have done your best to make that as subjective as possible. I mean, I'm sorry, objective as possible. Now we know that anything human beings have or that they're involved with is gonna have some subjectivity to it, but you need to make it as objective as possible when looking 
at closing the achievement gap. You're looking at evidence, you're looking at data because you don't want to mess with that data or manipulate that data and just make it about, well, I feel like this person. Feel is not evidence. You can feel that way all you want to. It's very subjective and it's not evidence. So we need hard court evidence to close the achievement gaps, especially among diverse student populations. Practicing, it's culturally sensitive and ad sensitive advising and counseling. So these are the three necessities for the counselor and student relationship. You gotta have accurate empathy, you have to be genuine, and you need unconditional positive regard. And I have what those mean there. We know that empathy is being able to stand in someone else's shoes and feel what they feel. You know exactly how they're, well, not exactly, because you can never, never know exactly, but you have an idea based on, maybe you've been through the same, maybe your mother has passed away and you can relate to that. You can connect because your mother passed away and their mother passed away. And so you can relate to them in that manner. Genuineness, allow the, the student to be comfortable with who they are and you, being comfortable with who you are and making sure that you're congruent in your words, your actions, and your feelings. And then unconditional positive regard. You have worth, you have value. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, you still have worth and you're still valuable. Ensuring all students' rights are respected and needs, and needs are met. Um, and I like this diagram because all children have needs. Children are entitled to have their needs met. Needs can only be met if adults take responsibility for meeting them. Recognition of responsibilities lead to recognition that children have rights and fulfillment of rights means children's needs are met. So rights and needs are right there together. They're blended together. People do not, this is a quote that I made up after looking at this chart, this diagram. People do not happily and voluntarily go to places where they do not feel safe. They need to feel safe. They're, they're, they need to feel safe physically. They need to feel safe psychologically. They need to feel like they can get their, their goals met at this place. They need to feel safe that way. They need to feel safe to be creative, to be expressive. So they're not gonna keep coming to school. They're not gonna come and see you in your comprehensive counseling program if they do not feel safe. Um, communication. So number eight has to do with consulting and collaborating with stakeholders. And I got the definitions, uh, the keyword definitions on the side, but I felt like I really need to talk, needed to talk about communication here. Communication addresses so many needs. Most of these nine uh, statements they go in and out of each other. They interact with each other and weave in and out of each other. And so we, I'm sure you've seen that as we've gone through. So we want to be uh, right over here. We want communication to be transactive. Uh, we don't want communication to be a one-way process. We don't want it to be like a ping pong game. You serve, I serve you back, you serve. But we want it to be interactive. And the stages of team development. Like I am shocked when a team gets the, together and they don't know about the fact that a team has to go through a development process. You have to form, you're gonna have some differences and some conflict and conflict is healthy as long as it's dealt with in healthy manners. Then you're gonna develop some norms and then you're gonna perform. And only after you've gone through these processes are you gonna be able to get to the performance level. School climate. These are the four buckets that school climate improves when you have a positive school climate. It improves safety. It improves teaching and learning. It improves institutional environment. It improves interpersonal relationships. So as you can see, school climate is so important and there's more information at the National School Counselor Climate Council uh, website. And last, number nine, 
I created this ethnological map because I've had students to do it um, in my graduate classes. And so I decided to go on and do it too. And so I took myself at about age nine in fourth grade and I did what was around me. Where did I live? What was going on with me at that time? Where were some of the places that I went to? And so I implore you to go and do an ecological map on yourself first and then do one on someone that is totally different from you. Um, if you're black, do one on somebody that's Asian or somebody that's white. If you're heterosexual, do one on somebody that's bi. Do one on somebody that's lesbian. So I implore you to go and do that and because that's gonna help you to develop that empathy. It's gonna help you to develop an understanding of where they come from and why they're different from you and why they think the way they do. And you might not get all of that. You might not know exactly, but it at least give you a, a, a somewhat something to go by. And these are the six areas of cultural competency. And so the ones in the yellow are not where you need to be. You wanna be in the ones in the aqua and eventually you wanna be in the cultural proficiency. And I've just taken time and when you have time, go through each one of these. This is cultural destructiveness, cultural incapacity, cultural blindness, People say, I don't see color, and it's pretty hard not to see color. So cultural pre-competence, that's when you're starting on the positive side. Cultural competence, this is where we at least want you to be in your comprehensive school counselor program. And then cultural proficiency, and this is the optimal place to be eventually one day. So one way to increase your cultural intelligence is to do some of these things. Go to a church that's different from yours. Go to a party or some type of celebration when we can. We can't right now. Um, read a book that explores different culture, cultures. Um, volunteer at a community center. I'm trying to think of ones that you can do right now because some of these with social distancing we can't do right now, but we will be able to. Search for a cultural guide. Uh, I've done that before after my, I did my ancestry test and I found out that I have Nigerian in me. And so then I started doing some research on Nigerians and how do they behave in business and, and what do they do? Because I know somewhere in my DNA is Nigerian. And so I wanted to know that and understand that because this, it's a part of me. <clears throat> This is a video of an actual camera safari in South Africa. They're crouching. She's crouching. And what the lawyer was telling us while the video played is that when you're dealing with something powerful like the government or like white supremacy, Often, the victims are the smallest and the weakest. She got him. Oh, she did. She got him. And that is hopeless. Drag him out. Like we feel that the quagmire of race in America is hopeless. It's a crocodile. And just when you think it can't get any worse, it does. Charleston, South Carolina, and then Charlottesville, Virginia. Where does it stop? That is the definition of hopeless. Oh my God. Oh, they're going to fight a bit. The lions have won, have they? Because mom and dad water buffalo went and got the whole herd. 
A man who has what sounds like either a British or South African accent is actually a guide. And he said that he had never seen behavior like this before. And I feel like we, as a community, as a progressive community, as a forward-thinking community, have a lot more influence than we recognize. But sometimes we just mill around because we don't know what to do. And sometimes it will take one person, just one person, to step out and do something. Whoa. And my suggestion is that when you do that, it actually feels good. Watch him going back. Is there some strut in his step there? He's like, get the F out of here and don't even come back. And even when that person will step out of our group and demonstrate that there are things that can be done, sometimes the group is still not ready. And it takes one other person to do something maybe a little more dramatic. Ooh. And now, everybody is involved. And they're like, no, don't just go away, keep going away. And remember, it was hopeless. There was no rational way to think that this was going to succeed. Yeah, it's still alive. Yeah, it's trying to get away. The lawyer in Indiana, or from Indiana, who showed us this at the end of this film said, This is the most human behavior I've ever seen because it was hopeless and so even if it looks hopeless that you can do anything we are hope dealers and so we're we may be the last person that a kid has to be a champion for them so i just want to ask you be a champion for our kids and thank you for coming to my session.